Welcome to Color Me Green, a podcast focused on making the world a greener place. So this week has been very interesting, very eventful. I've got some great things going on that I will chat about in a future episode, but as of right now, just moving on up and moving forward. So today's episode is very random, actually. It was never on my list of episode ideas until I went grocery shopping and made a TikTok video on eggs. I remembered a video I watched discussing different living conditions or production styles of egg production hens, or whatever they're called. Then I had a discussion with my mom, who was convinced that free-range hens and pasture-raised hens were the same. Well, mom, I am here today to prove you wrong. And educate you, of course. Before we begin the episode, I want to give a shout out to Vital Farms. I have bought their eggs now for a while, and not only do they have the best eggs, I actually just had some this morning, and they were amazing. They have the best eggs with the greatest living conditions for their hens. But like, have you seen their packaging? It not only has beautiful artwork on the outside, but once you open your carton, you get the cutest little newspaper called the Vital Times. It includes a hen of the month. I mean, how adorable is that? It also includes a little comic on the back, a recipe, and a little snippet of their mission. If you don't love them enough already, this little newspaper article is also printed on biodegradable paper stock with vegetable-based ink. I mean, come on. Their ethical practices don't just stop at their hens. This is not sponsored by them, unfortunately, but I just wanted to say I love them. Now on with today's episode. Okay, this was a very hard episode to research for. As I'm sure you can imagine, there were some photos that came up in the articles that just shredded my soul. With that being said, there are many different types of production styles, some obviously being more humane than others. So let's start with a general overview of the life cycle of a laying hen, and then we will move into the worst type of production, moving on to the best form of production. The typical life cycle of a layer hen in commercial egg production goes through several stages, from hatching to retirement. I do want to put a little trigger warning in here if you want to call it that. I will be discussing the process as it happens without leaving out any steps that I'm aware of. The first stage starts at the hatchery. Day one. Here, eggs are incubated and hatched. Male chicks, which are not suitable for egg laying purposes, are often separated and culled shortly after hatching, a controversial practice known as chick culling. This part of the hatchery is where workers, who by the way, have to literally have no soul to work here. How someone could do this for a living, doing any part of this process I'm going to discuss is just beyond me. Looking at a helpless little animal and getting to decide whether it lives or dies, I would die. Anyway, this is where workers determine the gender of each chick. Females will be sent for beak trimming, vaccination, and a rearing facility, while male chicks are disposed of. Not like sold or sent to live on a happy little farm somewhere. No. Disposed of. This is because male chicks don't lay eggs and are of no value to the industry. Since they have not been bred or genetically altered to be ideal for meat consumption, which is a completely different topic. Oh my god, I had no idea that was a thing. They can't be diverted to a broiler facility, meaning a place for meat birds. Therefore, they are killed soon after hatching. The males are disposed of in one of several ways. This is hard on the heart, so brace yourself. They are shredded alive in a maciator, gassed, ground alive in an auger, or sometimes thrown into plastic containers and suffocated. Sometimes the remains of these chicks are used to make low-grade animal feed and filler. These methods of disposal vary depending on the country and region. Right after the culling, the female birds will have their beaks trimmed. Debeaking is often performed on those destined for caged, free-ranged, or organic barn systems. 
However, some of these may opt out of the procedure based on their country or certification requirements. Debeaking is almost always done without anesthesia. Within the breeding stock, male birds may have their beaks trimmed, the last joint on the medial and back toes cut off. Not sure why that's necessary, but okay. Actually, I do know why. It's later on in the episode, something is mentioned about because they're so closely confined and like territorial issues, they don't want like fighting and stuff. So that's probably why. Debeaking is often done by using heated guillotines or infrared laser operated blades utilizing temperatures up to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. A baby chick's beak is known to have an extensive nerve supply and are a complex functional organ. Some psychological changes can occur in these cut nerves and damaged tissue that can lead to acute or long-term pain. This in turn can lead to behavioral issues, reduced social activity, lethargy, and changes to guarding behavior. It can also result in reduced feed and water intake and thus dehydration and illness due to a weakened immune system. This whole process of debeaking is due to the stress brought on by intensive confinement, like I mentioned earlier, and being deprived of natural behaviors. The industry wishes to prevent the inevitable aggressive predatory behavior and pecking, which can lead to widespread injuries amongst the flock. Wouldn't be necessary though if they weren't kept in such tight conditions. Just saying. High stocking densities and intensive confinement are ideal environments for the potential emergence and spread of avian diseases. As a result, the chicks must be vaccinated. There are six to eight different viruses chicks are immunized against. Vaccinations are administered a number of ways, usually through injections, their drinking water, or spraying. Salmonella is always a concern and is controlled in some regions better than others. Anticoccidial drugs are often given to hens to prevent coccidiosis, a parasite infection in the gut of the birds that can lead to reduced laying production, laying productivity, and death. Red mites are also a concern in both caged and non-caged systems and are difficult to control. Thus, barns and sheds often have to be disinfected with sprays. Stage 2, brooding, weeks 1 to 6. After hatching, the female chicks are placed in a brooder house, where they are kept warm and provided with access to food and water. During this stage, they require careful monitoring and care to ensure their health and development. Stage 3, grow out, weeks 6 to 18. As the chicks grow, they are transferred to larger facilities with more space. Here, they continue to receive a balanced diet to support their growth and development. During this period, the pullets, young hens, begin to mature and their bodies prepare for egg production. Stage 4, point of lay, weeks 18 to 24. Around 18 to 24 weeks of age, hens reach the point of lay meaning they are biologically ready to start laying eggs. They are moved to the laying facility, where the housing and environment conditions differ depending on the production systems, which we will get into later. Stage 5, egg production, weeks 24 to 72 and so on. Once in the laying facility, hens begin laying eggs. In battery cage systems, they are typically housed in small cages with limited mobility, while in cage-free or free-range systems, they have more space and access to perches and nesting areas. Lighting conditions, diet, and environmental factors are carefully controlled to optimize egg production. Stage 6, end of lay, around 72 weeks. The production capacity of laying hens declines with age. After approximately 72 weeks, their egg production significantly decreases. After this point, hens are often considered economically unviable for egg production and are typically removed from the facility. Stage 7, retirement or processing. Depending on the production system and local practices, hens may be retired to sanctuaries, adopted by individuals, or sent for processing, often for meat products or pet food. It's essential to note that the conditions in which layer hens are raised can vary widely depending on the production system and the farm's specific practices. Some systems prioritize animal welfare and provide more space and enrichments for hens, while others are more intensive and may involve smaller cages or confinement. Now let's move on to the types of production environments. First, we have the worst, being those battery cages I mentioned. 
Battery cages have been a common method of housing laying hens in commercial egg production, but they have raised significant welfare concerns. Battery cages are usually arranged in rows and stacked atop one another within windowless sheds that lack outdoor access. These cages, constructed of metal wire, are typically around 20 inches by 20 inches in size. Each hen is usually afforded only 67 square inches of cage space, which is less than a single sheet of paper. They incorporate features such as feeding troughs, nipple drinkers, and slanted wire floors to facilitate the collection of eggs onto a conveyor. In certain regions, battery cages have been phased out or are in the process of elimination as seen in the European Union, with some countries committing to abandoning them as early as 2025. Nevertheless, battery cages persist as the predominant system in emerging markets and developing nations. Many of these battery cage systems are simply being substituted with enriched or colony cages. Battery cages lack perches and nesting areas, and due to the wire flooring, hens have no access to litter for scratching or dust bathing. These cages can be vertically stacked in A-frame configurations, sometimes reaching three rows in height. Inside sheds capable of housing up to 125,000 hens. In larger operations, farms can accommodate over a million hens collectively. An alternative housing system is the enriched or furnished cage, offering more space, nest boxes, and limited perching opportunities. Some enriched cages also include a small litter area and a device for claw shortening. These cages generally house around 10 birds each, but larger versions, known as colony cages, can accommodate multiple birds. Hens in these confinement systems never experience natural light, remain within their cages permanently, and are deprived of fresh air. The only instances in which they may leave their cages are when they become ill, sustain injuries, die prematurely, or are transported for slaughter. Additional types of housing and laying setups can include multi-tier aviaries, single-tier barn systems, free-range or free-run systems. However, these alternatives represent a minority of the housing methods employed in global egg production. Although they offer improved welfare conditions for the birds, they tend to be more costly to operate and often lead to higher mortality rates among the producer's flock. Consequently, these factors contribute to elevated egg production costs in such facilities, making them less economically attractive. Unfortunately, traditional battery cage systems, despite their ethical concerns, remain the most financially lucrative option. This resistance to change within the industry is largely rooted in economic considerations. Other cons to this system is the lighting factor. The only source of light within a barn is provided by artificial lighting deliberately kept at a low level to limit the activity of the hens. Oftentimes, the artificial lighting remains switched on during nighttime and throughout the extended periods of darkness in the winter season to ensure continuous egg production throughout the year. Certain regions mandate eight-hour periods of darkness within every 24-hour cycle, although the specific requirements vary from one country to another. Another factor is hen health. In caged systems, hens are susceptible to a multitude of health issues. Constantly standing on wire floors can result in foot problems for the hens. It's not uncommon for hens in cages to stand on the body of a deceased hen, providing temporary relief from the discomfort of being on a wire mesh floor around the clock, especially when workers haven't removed the deceased bird. Additionally, intensive housing conditions can lead to feather loss in hens due to both physical and psychological stress. Surprisingly, ailments like foot pad dermatitis and bumble foot, typically associated with chickens raised for meat, have been observed in egg-laying hens, kept in free-run systems where litter quality, humidity control, or ventilation is suboptimal. The accumulation of feces and urine from tens of thousands of birds in a single shed, despite the presence of ventilation systems, results in elevated levels of ammonia and toxic gases. Some regions have regulations in place to limit permissible gas concentrations for the safety of workers measured in parts per million. Even when these gases are within acceptable levels, workers may still need to wear breathing apparatuses or filter masks when working in these facilities for extended durations. For the hens, the consequences of these gases include eye infections, viral infections, and upper respiratory issues. Lastly, we have the factor of forced molting. 
The act of depriving hens of food to maximize profit is referred to as forced molting. Molting, in its essence, signifies the shedding of old feathers to make way for the new ones. In the natural world, birds go through a yearly cycle of replacing all their feathers, ensuring they maintain healthy plumage throughout the year. Typically, a natural molt occurs as winter approaches. During this period, hens cease laying eggs and shift their focus toward conserving warmth and growing fresh feathers. Exploiting this natural phenomenon, the egg industry compels entire flocks to undergo simultaneous molting. This is carried out to manipulate the market and extract a few hundred additional eggs from fatigued hens, a more cost-effective approach than immediately slaughtering them after a year of relentless egg production on a diet lacking in calcium. The next type of production environment we have is cage-free. Cage-free. Sounds great, right? Wrong. As a response to the public's opposition to the confinement of hens in battery cages, many egg producers are transitioning to cage-free systems. These systems typically offer a notably improved level of animal welfare compared to battery cages. However, the mere absence of cages does not always guarantee high welfare standards. In contrast to battery-housed hens, cage-free hens have the freedom to walk, stretch their wings, and lay eggs in nests, essential natural behaviors that are denied to hens kept in cages. Most cage-free hens live in large flocks, often consisting of thousands of hens, and they typically remain indoors without access to the outdoors. The majority of cage-free farms undergo third-party audits from certification programs that require provisions such as perching and dust bathing areas to be in place. Cage-free systems do spare hens from several severe hardships that are inherent in battery cage systems. However, it would be incorrect to assume that cage-free facilities are inherently cruelty-free. Cage hens still go through the following. Male chicks being euthanized. Over 200 million male chick deaths occur annually in the U.S. alone. They undergo the painful procedure of debeaking. They are typically slaughtered before reaching two years of age, which is less than half of their natural lifespan. During the long-distance transportation to slaughter facilities, they aren't given access to food or water. I had to include this because after reading it, I personally thought that it was awful, of course. But then... Why would they feed the animals they're going to just kill anyway? That would be too nice and a waste of food, right? And lastly, they also go through the molting stage. While a majority of the battery and cage-free egg industry has moved away from using starvation to induce molting in birds, there are still some producers that continue to practice it. Therefore, while cage-free housing does not guarantee cruelty-free conditions, it generally results in significantly improved lives for hens when compared to the confinement they experience in battery cages. Next, we have a better option, but still not the best. Seems like the majority of environments these hens are raised in isn't ideal. Free range. The term free range conjures images of open landscapes where animals roam freely, enjoying natural diets and basking in sunlight. However, in the United States, there are currently no government regulations in place to guarantee this ideal scenario. Note the term free range or free roaming is used by the USDA and the exact wording may differ slightly depending on the regulatory body or organization. Free range is a term referring to a method of animal husbandry, where animals have the opportunity to freely wander outdoors rather than being confined to an enclosure around the clock. The USDA states that free range or free roaming chickens must be granted access to the outside. But the interpretation of this requirement can vary widely. Unfortunately, some major producers have adhered strictly to the letter of the law rather than its intended spirit by installing open windows or small doors leading to paved areas at the end of large, crowded hen houses. Additionally, these outdoor spaces are typically shared by 20,000 to 30,000 birds, residing in the same overcrowded housing with less than two square feet per hen. The outdoor space allocated to free-range hens is often more of a formality, as it tends to be insufficient in size, barren, and otherwise inadequate for the large number of hens being raised for eventual slaughter. These conditions are far from the picturesque notion of farm life or the best possible life for a hen. 
Consequently, these hens can legally be labeled as free range, despite their living conditions falling far short of what most would consider genuinely free. The term free range is just one instance of the food industry employing misleading labels, failing to provide comprehensive information to conscientious consumers. It exemplifies how the industry capitalizes on vague standards and limited oversight, allowing corporations to continue raising hens in tightly confined indoor conditions while benefiting from the more marketable free-range label. Now, what are the other disadvantages of free-range environments? Bringing back up the ammonia and the quality of air and hygiene levels in houses where hens live. And free-range still allows for debeaking. Additionally, they also still go through the hatchery, culling, and grow-out processes. Next, we have the best environment for egg-laying hens, pasture-raised. These hens are provided a minimum of 108 square feet of space per hen. Their diet consists of a carefully balanced supplemental feed complemented by foraging for natural foods like grass, worms, and bugs when they venture outdoors. They are allowed to roam outside the barns from early morning until dusk after which they return to the safety of the barn to protect themselves from predators. Vital Farms introduced pasture-raised standards to the United States in 2007. According to Matt O'Hare, the founder of Vital Farms, the barn doors remain open throughout the day, starting within three hours of sunrise and closing around dusk, aligning with the hen's natural instinct to seek shelter at night. These hens have daily access to pastures, fresh air, and sunshine all year round, as their farms are located in the pasture belt, allowing them the freedom to come and go as they please. From a nutritional perspective, pasture-raised eggs exhibit some differences compared to factory eggs. Pasture-raised eggs typically contain higher levels of vitamin A, omega-3 fatty acids, and vitamin E. O'Hara attributes these differences to the diverse diet and lifestyle of pasture-raised hens. His hens enjoy a lifestyle characterized by cleanliness, reduced stress, minimal competition, ample fresh air, and sunlight, factors that contribute to the superior quality of the eggs. Vital Farms also maintains a dedicated grower support team, committed to ensuring that their farmers receive the necessary support to constantly adhere to Vital Farm standards. Additionally, these farms undergo audits by as many as six independent agencies, including the Certified Humane Program, to ensure compliance with ethical and welfare standards. However, not all pasture-raised eggs are of the same quality. This is why some egg producers opt for additional certifications like the Certified Humane Pasture Seal. This seal offers the advantage of indicating that the eggs adhere to specific pasture-related standards and originate from farms subjected to inspections. These farms also undergo traceability audits to ensure that every egg in the carton originates from certified humane pasture farms. The certified humane pasture seal signifies that these hens are allowed to freely roam on the pasture during daylight hours, engaging in behaviors such as foraging, running, perching, bathing, and socializing as they see fit. The farms provide amenities like shade tents, water coolers, and, in some instances, trees for the hens to enjoy. Each farm bearing this seal is subject to scrutiny by an inspector who possesses a master's degree or doctorate in animal science and is an expert in the species they assess. According to Jeff Hines of Vital Farms, given the absence of federally defined standards for pasture-raised hens, the certified humane seal holds value as a third-party certification from a recognized and trustworthy organization, essentially serving as a seal of approval. And they have my seal of approval. Out of all of the environments and production processes that we discussed, I am going to continue buying Vital Farm eggs, or any certified humane pasture-raised eggs. Honestly, as most things are when they are better for you, these eggs do tend to be more pricier than caged, cage-free, or free-roaming. I think at Target, they're like, $8 for a dozen eggs, but I personally don't want to knowingly support the inhumane treatment of hens. I hope every one of you that listens to this makes the same decision, or at least this episode crosses your mind next time you're in the egg aisle. Your next egg purchase could support not only hen health, but your own as well. I want to thank you for listening to today's episode of Color Me Green. New episodes come out on Wednesdays, and hopefully each one has something you can take away and learn from. 
If you want to request a certain topic to discuss, please feel free to message me on the show's Instagram at Color Me Green Podcast, linked in the show notes. If you loved today's episode, please make sure to leave a review and let others know what you think of the show. One of the best ways to help change the world is to share this episode with a friend and let them also learn what they can do to live more sustainably. Always remember to reduce, reuse, recycle, and live green.